Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for day two of Mystery Week. Today we've got a solved serial killer case which I'm sure will excite many of you. Serial killer cases are my personal favourite ones to cover but you guys seem to really like the solved ones so hopefully this is great for both of us. Today we're covering the weepy voiced killer. This is going to include some very creepy voicemails so if you're easily creeped out or you're watching it late on your own in the dark maybe hold off maybe it's just a little bit creepy this serial killer is so named because after every attack he would call the police expressing his remorse telling the police where he can find the victim how he killed them and he would do so in a really high-pitched weeping voice these attacks started on new year's eve 1980 in the twin cities of minnesota minneapolis and St Paul. They're so called twin cities because they were originally separate but as they grew so much they kind of grew into each other so it's basically two cities in one which isn't just a fun trivia fact that little tidbit will come in useful later. Like I said it begins on New Year's Eve 1980 with an attack on 20 year old Karen Potak. Karen is in St Paul with her sister celebrating the new year and they're out at a nightclub together. However, for whatever reason, Karen decides to leave a little bit earlier and leaves on her own. She didn't have a long walk to get back home, so she was just walking through the streets of St Paul when a car pulls up next to her and the man in the car offers her a lift and Karen gets in. The man drove her to a secluded area and brutally bludgeoned her around the head with a tire iron. However, at 3am, 911 operators receive a very creepy phone call. Yes, please, this is an emergency. Please send a squad to Pierce Butler Road, uh, Malmberg Manufacturing Company, Machine Shop. Please, there's an ambulance, too. There's a girl hurt there. Can you tell me what happened to her? Just hurry. There's a, she's laying on the ground in the back by the, by the railroad tracks, by the edge here. What, what's the address? I don't know. Who are you? Police arrive at the scene quickly. Karen Potak is lying by the side of a railway behind a manufacturing company. Now, miraculously, she's still alive, even though she's so brutally bludgeoned that the police can see her brain. She's rushed to hospital and somehow she manages to survive. However, she has no memory of the attack at all. And police searched high and low for whoever did this to Karen because she had no memory. They had nothing to go on and it kind of just turned into a cold case. Six months later, on the 3rd of June 1981, police receive a second 911 call. Oh, yeah. You find me, I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. Shortly after this, the body of 18-year-old Kimberly Compton is found in a wooded area by a group of teenage boys. She was stabbed 61 times in the chest with an ice pick, just as the caller said, but she'd also been strangled with a shoelace. Now, police managed to trace the call this time. They trace it to a bar opposite the bus station in St Paul. However, of course, by the time they arrive, there's nobody there. Now, when police found Kimberly, she had no idea on her, so they had no way of finding out who she was. However, she did have a locker key for the bus station, and of course, the police took the key to the bus station, opened the locker, and found all of Kimberly's luggage, along with her ID. They managed to put together what had happened to Kimberly that night. Sadly, she had only been in St Paul for a matter of hours. She was from a small town called Pepin and had just graduated and had dreams of moving to the big city after graduation. And this is what she'd been doing. She had literally arrived in St Paul, put her luggage away in a locker so she could go across to Mickey's Diner across the street to eat their special that night. You know that's what she did from the contents of her stomach. It's thought that while she was in Mickey's Diner or shortly after she left, she was approached by a man. Police interviewed staff and customers at Mickey's Diner that night, but nobody had seen anything, so it was another dead end. However, two days later, 911 received another call. Don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. Don't know why I had to stab her. I am so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every day, and I can't believe it. It's like a big dream. I can't think of being locked up. If I get locked up, I'll kill myself. I'd rather kill myself than get locked up. I'll try not to kill anybody else. 
Police actually released the audio of this particular call to the public, hoping that somebody will recognise the voice. I mean, it's quite distinctive, isn't it? Literally hundreds of tips come in from people saying it sounds like people they know. However, none of it leads to anything. It's around this time that the media dubbed the killer as the weepy voiced killer. Nine months after this, so around March 1982, police believe they get their first lead in the case. There was a mentally ill man who had recently committed suicide who apparently confessed to the murder of Kimberly Compton. The police really took this and ran with it, trying to piece together the timeline, desperate to make it work because they just wanted to have somebody to pin these murders on. However, it eventually turned out that he couldn't have been responsible for Kimberly's death because he was in jail that night. So it was the 6th of August 1982, Barbara Simons is out at a bar and she's seen by a lot of people dancing and laughing with a man. Barbara later makes a comment to a waitress saying, I hope this man's nice, he's giving me a lift home. And that's exactly what happens. Barbara leaves the bar with this man and it's the last time she's ever seen alive. Hours later, 911 receive another call. Fire emergency. Please don't talk to this person. I'm sorry, I killed, I killed. The body of Barbara Simons was later found on an embankment of the Mississippi River over in Minneapolis. She had been stabbed over a hundred times and this was the third kill by the weepy voice killer, officially making him a serial killer. Police managed to piece together Barbara's movements the day she died and they eventually went to the bar to interview all of the staff and luckily they interviewed the waitress who Barbara had spoken to earlier in the night. This waitress remembered the entire interaction between Barbara and herself. I don't know what it is about what happened that made the waitress really cling on to this memory, but luckily she did. And this waitress had had a really clear look at this man as well. She could remember his face clearly. So the police start to show her photos of possible suspects, and I'm talking hundreds of photos. Eventually they get to the photo of one man, and the waitress says without a doubt, this is the man Barbara was speaking to. He was called Paul Michael Stefani. Stefani had previously been arrested for aggravated assault and the police immediately put him under constant surveillance. Police also discovered that three years earlier, Stefani had been fired from a manufacturing company, the same manufacturing company behind which the body of Karen Potak was found. Whilst under surveillance on the 20th of August, 1982, Stefani manages to lose his police tail. He drives to the red light district of Minneapolis and picks up 19 year old prostitute, Denise Williams. They drove her to his apartment and they had sex before Stefani offered to drive Denise back to her corner. Now Denise knows the area really well and whilst they're driving, Denise notices that Stefani is taking some odd turns. He tells her he's driving the back roads because it's a shortcut but she knows this isn't true and she knows that she's probably in trouble at this point. She'd been a prostitute on the streets since she was 13 years old and was clearly very street smart. She knew something was up. She looks around his car for a weapon and notes that there's a glass bottle rolling around on the floor. Eventually he pulls into a dark car park and Denise tries to get out but he grabs her before stabbing her in the stomach with a screwdriver. In return, she grabs the glass bottle and smashes it around his head, causing him pretty severe injuries. He continues stabbing Denise until she falls out of the car, and as she rolls out, he rolls on top of her. So they're just on the ground fighting, she's still hitting him with the glass bottle, and he's still stabbing her. A man living nearby hears the commotion and runs outside and tries to help Denise, but instead, Stefani tries to attack him. So this guy runs back inside and immediately calls 911. Stefani flees the scene in his car. Denise was stabbed 15 times and she gets rushed to hospital where she has emergency surgery and manages to survive. Later that night, 911 receive another call from Stefani, but this one has a difference. Instead of expressing his regret about the attack, he's actually requesting medical assistance. And obviously he's not using his usual weepy high voice. It doesn't take long for the police to put together Denise and Stefani's injuries and so the police along with the paramedics 
head to Stefani's apartment. He was arrested and taken to jail where eventually Denise picked him out of a lineup. He was arrested when he was 37 years old with a history of mental problems, a previous conviction for aggravated assault, and he was also recently divorced. He denied any involvement in the rest of the Weepy Voice killer attacks, but the police knew better. He was also charged with the murder of Barbara Simons, as this had also happened in Minneapolis. The rest of them had happened over the river in St. Paul. This meant there was a different jurisdiction to where Kimberly Compton and Karen Potak were attacked. Therefore, the St. Paul's authorities would have had made the charges for those cases. There was a six week trial in which he pled not guilty to the murder of Barbara Simons, and he also pled not guilty to the attack on Denise Williams despite all of the evidence. All police really had to do to get a conviction was to confirm a match on the audio, so they brought in experts who said that they could be pretty certain that the voice was that of Stefani's, but they couldn't confirm 100%. The people close to him as well were also called in to confirm that the voice was a match. We're talking his sister, his ex-wife and a neighbour of his, all who confirmed the voice was definitely that of Stefani's. Eventually he's found guilty of the murder of Barbara Simons and he's sentenced to 40 years. He's also found guilty of the attack on Denise Williams and that gives him an extra 18 years. Prosecutors in St Paul didn't pursue a case against him for the murder of Kimberly Compton and the attack on Karen Potak because they believed that the audio evidence wasn't enough. Although at this point the case is officially unsolved for Karen and Kimberly, at least the families knew that it was very likely that Stefani was the one who attacked them. In 1998, Stefani died from skin cancer in jail. He was diagnosed in 97 and at this point he decided to come forward and confess all of his crimes. He confesses to the attack on Karen, Barbara and Kimberly's murders and the attack on Denise, but he also confesses to another murder which he was never even a suspect for. This was the death of Kathleen Greening. Now this one took a little bit of a turn from the rest of his attacks. It didn't quite match up with his usual MO, so he wasn't even on the radar for this. Kathleen had died by being drowned in her bathtub and there'd be no weird 911 call made afterwards. For some reason in Stefani's head, this murder didn't make him feel guilty or remorseful like the rest of them did. So police began to look back at the evidence in Kathleen's case and they came across Kathleen's address book. And in the address book was a name, P. Stefani, with his exact phone number in it. So there was a connection there. It's kind of thought that maybe Stefani didn't feel as guilty about this one because he knew Kathleen in person. Clearly they had some kind of connection and his MO here was just very different from the rest. Kathleen was just 33 years old when she was drowned in her own bathtub on July 21st, 1982. This was just a couple of weeks before the murder of Barbara Simons. The big question here is was he really truly remorseful on the phone calls or was it all just part of a game? He said ever since he was in jail that he just felt so guilty, he had this like inbuilt urge to kill women but he couldn't deal with the after effects of it which is why he would call the police. Let me know what you guys think, do you think he was genuinely remorseful and clearly he must have been fairly mentally ill to be in this state or was it all part of a cat and mouse game with the police? And that's everything I have on this case. I suppose Karen and Kimberly did get justice in the end because he did admit to it in jail eventually, which is something for the families at least. I do wish though that the St Paul prosecutors would have been more willing to press these charges in the first place. If you enjoyed this, please make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I'll be back here at this time again tomorrow and I'll see you there. Bye guys.